Tena koto tefano o Unitarians, uh, o Tamaki Makoto. Tena koto na manahiri. No mai haere mai me te ki tene whare karakia o te atua. Ko Ted Zorn toko ingwa, no Charleston, South Carolina aho. Ko Cooper River te awa, e noho ana o ke tamaki makoro. Ko ia ka hore nei i rapu te kitia. No rera e rau rangatira ma, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. Welcome all, church whanau and visitors, to this place of worship, virtual and physical, a space made sacred by our coming together today and by Auckland Unitarians gathering for over 122 years. Consider this time together today a sanctuary for the soul, a haven of peace and hope. It's a time to reflect on what it means to be human, what it means to be connected to our fellow humans, and how we spend our time and energy on this earth. Welcome to those joining us remotely, to those here in the building, and to those who may watch the recording at a later time. If you're a visitor here for the first time, thank you for choosing to be here with us. Uh, if you are a member or a regular attendee, thank you for returning to join together with us in our free and responsible search for truth and meaning. I invite those in the church uh, to stay after the service to join us for morning tea. It is our sacrament of hospitality. My name is Ted Zorn and I'll be leading the service today. The, the whakatoki that I uh, said in my opening, ko ia kahore ne irapu te kitia, means he who does not seek will not find which I thought was fitting for the service today, which has the theme of what I've called a more beautiful question. Now, instead of opening words, I'm going to try something uh, a little different today, which I'm hoping you'll be open to. Um, I'd like to get us deeper into the spirit of questioning with a, with a meditation. Frank is going to, to play softly while I talk you through the, the meditation. You don't have to do anything weird. You don't have to lay on the floor or anything. Just um, sit comfortably in your, in your chairs. Um, maybe you're grappling with your own uncertainty or important questions. Uh, or maybe you're feeling overwhelmed by the uncontrollable things happening in your life or in our world, and you can't grasp where it's all going or what's going to happen next. Well, this meditation is for you. So, Frank. So I invite you to pause for a moment and find a comfortable posture. Perhaps you would like to close your eyes or maintain a soft, unfocused gaze. Straighten your back and release any tension you're feeling in your body. Relax your arms and legs. Relax your face, your shoulders, your belly. We're going to take three deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. So let's take the first breath. Inhale deep to the top of your lungs. And exhale slowly. And another inhale. And exhale. The last one, deep breath in and out. Feel your body sink into deep relaxation. Now, I'm going to read a series of affirmations. Each is a sort of declaration of strength. I invite you to repeat the affirmations in your mind. I'll say each one slowly and give you time to repeat it two or three times silently before I move on to the next. It's okay to feel confused and doubtful sometimes and not know all the answers. I might be feeling scared or anxious right now, but I am safe. I grow through the uncertainty I go through. I don't always need to be right or to win 
I am enough as I am. It's okay for me to make choices that I believe will bring me joy. It's okay for me to make choices that I believe will bring me peace. I am doing the best I can today, and tomorrow is another day. I focus on the current moment and meet whatever arises with my presence. I am patient. I am resilient. I have faith. Now take a deep breath in and exhale. And start slowly getting back to your body. Gently move your toes, fingers, and when you're ready, open your eyes. It's now time for our chalice lighting, and um, I didn't ask in advance, but Rachel, would you mind? Why do we light a chalice as part of our service? Hans Deutsch, an Austrian artist, first brought together the chalice and the flame as a Unitarian symbol during his work with the Unitarian Service Committee in World War II. To Deutsch, the image had connotations of sacrifice and love. We today have many different interpretations of the flaming chalice, including the light of reason, the warmth of community, and the flame of hope. Now, if you wish to recite with me the covenant of our congregation, John will share the words to the covenant on the screen. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is the sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covenant with each other and with our God. My reading today is a poem appropriately called The Question by Ellen Wheeler Wilcox. Beside us in our seeking after pleasures, through all our restless striving after fame, through all our search for worldly gains and treasures, there walketh one who no man likes to name. Silent he follows, veiled of form and feature indifferent if we sorrow or rejoice. Yet that day comes when every living creature must look upon his face and hear his voice. When that day comes to you and death unmasking shall bar your path and say, behold the end, what are the questions that he will be asking about your past? Have you considered, friend? I think he will not chide you for your sinning nor for your creeds or dogmas will he care. He will but ask from your life's first beginning, how many burdens have you helped to bear? So I've entitled my talk today, A More Beautiful Question. Um, I borrowed the, the title from a book by the same name, written by the former Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, Warren Burger. I'll say more about him later. You remember the scene from Alice in Wonderland when Alice asked the Cheshire Cat, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the Cheshire Cat answers, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Alice says, I don't much care where. And the Cheshire Cat replies, then it doesn't matter which way you go. 
You could argue that Alice's was an imperfect question, not a beautiful one. She asked a question without knowing what sort of answer she wanted or what would in fact be a useful answer. It was a question somewhat lacking in purpose or focus. But you don't need to read too deeply between the lines to see that she was just asking for help. She was lost. At least she asked. There have been times in my life when I've been lost and not known what question to ask either. Maybe you found yourself in a similar situation. Just asking in some cases is enough. So I want to make three points today in my talk. First, questioning is an important part of who we are as Unitarians. And it is a part of our identity and tradition that we should embrace. Second, questioning implies uncertainty. And both questioning and uncertainty can make us, uh, and sometimes those around us, uncomfortable. Third, getting to the heart of the title, all questions are not created equal. Some are more beautiful than others. So, questioning and Unitarianism. We Unitarians have raised questioning, especially questioning authority, to an art form. We question because we either don't think there are simple answers, or because we have doubts about the answers that have been handed down to us. We also question because we suspect that things could be better, could be more just than the status quo. Our questioning spirit has led to us UUs occasionally being the butt of jokes, such as Unitarian Universalism is where you go to get your answers questioned. And one of my favorites by the late great comedian Lenny Bruce, who said, I know my humor is outrageous when it makes the Unitarians so mad they burn a question mark on my front lawn. Unitarianism and Universalism, long before they merged, were movements driven by questions that challenged the religious norms of their times. Unitarianism emerged during the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century and dared to ask if the doctrine of the Trinity was scriptural. This questioning led Unitarians to emphasize the oneness of God and reject the notion of Jesus as a deity. Their questioning spirit was not content with accepting traditional dogmas. They sought a deeper, more rational faith. Early Unitarian leaders were willing to risk their lives for the questions they asked and the answers that they sought. One of them, Michael Servetus, was ordered by John Calvin to be burned at the stake. And another, Francis David, died in prison, in both cases for questioning religious doctrine. Universalism arose from a different question. Could a loving God truly condemn souls to eternal damnation? Universalists answered that question by boldly proclaiming that God's love is all-encompassing and that salvation is universal. Universalist leaders questioned the harsh doctrines that were prominent in their day. And this laid the foundation for a religion based on hope, inclusivity, and the inherent worth of every individual values that carry on with us today. What unites these two streams of our heritage is the courage to ask hard questions. These, these were not mere intellectual exercises. They, the questions that they asked went to the heart of human existence, morality, and our understanding of the divine. The questions provoke controversy, discomfort, and sometimes even persecution. But they were also questions that led to liberation, to reform, and a profound search for truth. That questioning spirit continues today and is in stark contrast to the dogma embraced by most contemporary religions. The sociologist and theologian Peter L. Berger, not Warren Berger, said, the basic fault lines today are not between people with different beliefs, but between people who hold those beliefs with an element of uncertainty and people who hold those beliefs with a pretense of certitude. So that leads me to my second point about questioning and certainty. Our rejection of, of dogma and principles four and five uh, mean that we emphasize a free and responsible search for truth and meaning and the right of conscience. And those mean that we reject simple answers and, and we embrace uncertainty. But uncertainty makes even us uncomfortable and some people even uh, more uncomfortable than others. 
there's a natural tension that we humans experience between certainty and questioning. And I believe that tension is important for us to recognize and embrace as part of our spiritual journey. The literary theorist Kenneth Burke, who many consider the founding father of my academic discipline, communication studies, wrote an odd but intriguing characterization of what makes us human. He said that we are, quote, goaded by the spirit of hierarchy and rotten with perfection. Goaded by the spirit of hierarchy and rotten with perfection. As I said, odd but intriguing. He's saying that we're compelled towards order and clarity, certainty, if you will, uh, and especially certainty on what's good and bad, best and worst, uh, perfect and flawed, and so on. That's the hierarchy part, that's separation. And we often take this need to get it right too far. That's the rotten with perfection part. Burke is, is one of many great thinkers who pointed out that a quest for certainty is fundamental to our human makeup. The quest for certainty leads us to look for answers, uh, especially simple, easy to understand, easy to recall answers. The widely touted principle Occam's razor sums this up. When faced with competing explanation for why something happens, the simplest explanation is likely the correct one. Similarly, and more colloquially, there's the KISS principle, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid, uh, which likewise pushes us towards simple, direct explanations. Now, there's a lot to be said for simplicity. Um, our lives are busy, they're complex, we often feel overwhelmed with information, with stimulation. Simplifying things can often bring peace and comfort, among other benefits. There's an there's a, a important movement towards simplicity, and personally, I'm always trying to find ways to simplify my life. But there's also a danger in simplifying, especially when simple becomes simplistic. Maybe, as Occam's razor suggests, the simplest explanation is often the best, but it's not always. Simplistic thinking is at the heart of many social problems and injustices. For example, the idea that race or nationality determines uh, achieve, achievement, trustworthiness, or criminality. The idea that people experience poverty because they're lazy. That the climate change we're experiencing is just part of a natural cycle. Trickle-down economics. All these are simplistic answers, and for some people, they're comforting and easy. They allow them not to have to consider more complex explanations or to look in the mirror for answers. So it's no wonder that people gravitate towards certainty and simplicity and avoid hard questions. As Unitarians, we embrace questions, but while we believe all people are equal in worth, not all questions are. So let me talk about the idea of a more beautiful question. Uh, like many teachers, Kate okay, mentioned you were a teacher, we, who want our students to be informed and to, and to think critically, I have often told my students there's no such thing as a stupid question. There have been times when I've been tempted to retract that statement. <laughs> but in all cases, I've tried to treat my students' questions with uh, respect and, and patience, even when they seemed stupid. I wouldn't say that to them. Try not to imply that. So as much as I'm praising questions and questioning in this talk, I don't want to suggest that all questions are good questions, and certainly all questions are not beautiful questions. Some questions are harmful and destructive. Consider the difference between these two questions. What can we do to make sure everyone in our community feels safe and valued? Versus, why do some people always cause trouble? The first question opens up possibilities for understanding and, and inclusivity while the second one seeks blame and scapegoating. People often use questions to imply criticism or to disguise an ulterior motive. Questions can be sarcastic. Oh, you think you're an expert now. They can imply criticism. Why did you pull into the left lane back there? Why do you always forget to put out the rubbish? They can be gaslighting. Don't you think you're overreacting? Are you feeling okay? Questions can be used to spread dis disinformation by leading the listener. Might it be true that vaccines cause more harm than good? 
Could we do more to reduce poverty by cutting taxes and regulation and allowing the economy to grow more quickly? These and others are often framed as innocent questions, especially when they're followed up by just asking. So there's no doubt that questions can be used for pernicious ends. But let's look at, what, let's look at what's possible. Let's look at what Berger calls beautiful questions. What makes your heart sing? What makes you feel most alive? What makes you feel at peace? What would you regret not doing in your life? What are you willing to fight for? To me, those are beautiful questions. Warren Berger said that a beautiful question is one that challenges assumptions, open up, opens up new avenues of thought, and leads to discovery. A beautiful question is one that, by its very nature, invites deeper engagement and reflection. In a world that often values quick answers and simple solutions, a beautiful question serves to stimulate deeper thinking, deeper understanding, reflection, wisdom. As Berger put it, quote, a beautiful question is an ambitious yet actionable question that, pe that can begin to shift the way we perceive or think about something. And that might serve as a catalyst to bring about change. Close quote. Think about some of the most significant moments in history. Many of them began with a question. What if? Why not? How might we? Is it possible? These questions have propelled us forward as humans, leading to scientific breakthroughs, social reforms, and personal transformations. They invite us to imagine new possibilities and to consider perspectives beyond our own. The late Robert F. Kennedy, paraphrasing the senior, not the one running for president now, the son. Uh, Kennedy, paraphrasing George Bernard Shaw, described a beautiful question when he said, some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. When we ask those beautiful questions though, one thing that often happens is a lifetime of baggage self-doubts, perceived limits on our abilities, learned helplessness and more, comes rushing in to limit your answers. An idea that might be helpful here is the, the Zen Buddhist concept of beginner's mind or Shoshin. Shoshin refers to the idea of letting go of your preconceptions and having an attitude of openness when approaching a subject or situation. This can be especially helpful if it's a situation that you're struggling with your spirituality, your relationship, or some troubling aspect of yourself, for example. There are some things that can help us cultivate beginner's mind, consciously letting go, even temporarily, of the need to be right, the need to win, the need to add value to a situation. Cultivate curiosity, saying to others, tell me more about that. In other words, ask a question. Or more questions. Meditation can help along the lines of what we, what we did earlier in the service to consciously cultivate Shoshin or beginner's mind. So when we get to the big questions that we face in our quest for truth and meaning, it's no wonder that many people opt for certainty or creeds or dogma. But there's equally good reason that we Unitarians respond with, hmm, I have questions about that. Asking beautiful questions about religion and spirituality, as well as what we want for our communities, our relationships, and ourselves, is worth doing. It is our tradition, and we should embrace it. Amen. So it's now time to extinguish the, the chalice. Rachel, if I could ask you again, please. Please join with me as we say the words for extinguishing the chalice, which John will now put on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. My closing words are a poem by Ann Hillman that I first heard in a, in a talk by our beloved Clay Nelson. It's, it's called, We Look With Uncertainty. We look with uncertainty beyond the old choices for clear-cut answers to a softer, more permeable aliveness. 
which is every moment at the brink of death. For something new is being born inside us, if we but let it. We stand at a new doorway, awaiting that which comes, daring to be human creatures, vulnerable to the beauty of existence, learning to love. As we leave here today to go out into the world, may, may we embrace a child's wonder in the physical world, in our fellow humans, in our relationships, and even in ourselves. May we ask challenging questions of ourselves, of each other, and our society. May we feel peace and comfort, not in the certainty that we have all the answers, but that we are part of a conversation, part of a journey towards greater understanding.